One of the best and worst parts of being a minister is weddings. I will tell you this, first of all, if you even notice, I do great weddings. But I would rather do a funeral than a wedding. Uh, mostly because for me, there's no rehearsal for a funeral. And there are no mothers of the deceased at a funeral. And I have never had a mother of the deceased yell at me for not doing the funeral right. Uh, but weddings bring out craziness in people. And uh, I do one thing, and I think a lot of the brides appreciate this. I sit every bride down and I tell them this, this is not about him. It's not about your mother. It's not about me. This is you. And I will do anything, and I will only answer to you. I don't care who you talk to, but I only answer to you. And uh, I will do anything you want as long as it's not illegal or immoral. And so that has caused me to have to do weddings with chickens running by and, and, and being out on golf courses as it snowed and everything. And so as long as it's not illegal or immoral, I tell these uh, brides it's about you. I do the rehearsal. I get the bride by me and I say, I don't listen to anybody but you. I don't care what your mother said. I'm listening to you. This is all about you. And uh, it's worked out pretty well for me in doing that. Because that is the bride's day, ladies. Yeah. Um, it is not your mother's day, it's your day. And I will do everything for that bride. Um, this week, if you pay attention to the news or YouTube things, there was a video that went around. And it really bothered me. And it was a video of a wedding. And uh, this priest, God bless him, needs to be smacked. This is about the bride's day. Um, what the priest did wrong, what really bothered me, is uh, first he thought the words were magic. There are no magic words when you get married. Young ladies, just because he says I do, he won't be a new guy. Oh, he says I do, it don't matter. No, he was an idiot before you got married. He'll be a bigger idiot now because he doesn't have to pretend. Uh, but he thought the words are magic. He also thought reverence equals solemn. Meaning, in order to be reverent with God, you have to be you know, dignified and all this other stuff. And, and I had somebody tell me I'm a horrible pastor because did something in this and, and you made a, a joke out about something during a, a ceremony and stuff and they said that's not what it's about that is horrible and I said well, God bless you I'm sorry I failed you on that but uh, reverence doesn't equal solemn but what made me the maddest when I saw this about this video clip which sort of works into us about today is he thought that this was about him or what he wanted if you looked at the clip the bride was smiling wasn't she she didn't care that the photographers were behind him taking clips. She was laughing and so was the groom. I don't care what the groom was thinking. The bride was happy. And she's happy while everything's going on. And when does her voice, when does her face change? And when does she stop being happy? When he turns around and like an idiot yells at the photographers and stops the whole story. Then her face is mortified. He thought this was all about him. And all about his words that he had to say. And that ties in greatly with what we're talking about today. If you're taking notes, religion makes you the most important person. It does. It's all about you in religion. It's about what you do. It's about how many times you pray. It's about where you kneel. It's about the candles you light. It's all about that. But religion will never get you to heaven. And religion will never save your family. Religion will never restore a relationship. But a relationship in Jesus Christ, that's completely different. You see, religion makes it about you and what you've done. A relationship with Jesus, now it makes it about Jesus. So this week, our breaking thought, my life will change when I get a new owner. When I get a new owner. No longer am I the one in charge. No longer do I make the decisions. Someone else will now make the decisions for me. Ladies, isn't this really what marriage is all about? Some of you ladies laugh because you know exactly what it is. I love, I love selling that joke to like unmarried men. They're like, I don't know why this is funny. Yeah, say I do. You'll find out real quick. <laughs> but my life will change. I will have a life-breaking moment when I am no longer the owner. And here the thing is, young people, listen to me just before I go on this. You will have an owner of your life. Somebody's going to own your life. You go down to a, a, a drug and rehab place, who owns their life? Alcohol, heroin, crack, marijuana. It all owns their life. They're consumed with it. I can take you to places with big, huge homes and people who can't afford the mortgage. Who owns their life? Materialism. 
or Visa, or Ford Motor Company, the payments they have to make. Something will own your life today. And I would suggest to you this, I have never found a better owner than Jesus Christ. Right. Something's going to own your life, young people. And until you get a new owner, you won't have a life-changing moment. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus is going to give a parable. And it is probably at least one of the top ten misused parables ever. Because just like the priest in our video, just like the priest, we forget who the attention of the parable is for. Listen, the reason God does miracles, the reason God gives the, the Word of God, the reason God gives the Holy Spirit, all of it, it is not for you to feel good. It's not for you to have some magic moment. It is not for your family. The reason all of it is about is all about pointing people to Jesus. See, that's the problem in your family. Your family doesn't point people to Jesus. It points people back to a, a, a lesson about why you shouldn't go in debt. Right? Your family points people back to a lesson about the dangers of drug and alcohol abuse. Your family points people back to why premarital sex is a disastrous thing to take place. That's the problem with your family and your life. Listen, everything that God gives us, even this church, the music we sing, it is all designed for one thing. To point people to God through Jesus Christ. That's it. Yep. And the mistake many people do in this parable is just like the priest. They think it's about them. So watch this. We start with a widow. Verse 1. Luke chapter 18. And he spoke a parable. And remember, a parable is a made-up story with a spiritual truth. There's always imagery. People represent people here. That men ought also to pray and to not faint. Okay. The topic of the prayer, parable is going to be prayer. Look at verse 2. Saying this, there was a city and a judge which feared not God, neither regarded men. The judge is sort of an official. Um, it was a place you would take complaints or, or legal problems. Sort of think of it as a high-bred version of like a, a mayor, a, a chief of police, and maybe even a congressman. If you love Andy Griffith, and if you're right with God, you do. If you love the Andy Griffith show, think about how Andy was in that show. He kind of ran that town, was really in charge of a lot of things and made decisions and stuff. Justice of the peace, sheriff, and everything. That's kind of like what the judge is. But the problem with this judge, he's corrupt, and he's lazy, and he didn't want to do his job. So look what happens in verse 3. We meet the widow. And there was a widow in that city. Remember, there's no social security, there's no welfare system. If, if you were a widow, you were basically stuck on the dependence of your children taking care of you. Uh, what happens if your children die? What happens if your family what if it disowns you issues? This is a difficult thing. That's why the church was told in James, one of the things you need to do is take care of orphans and widows. So verse 3. And she came unto him, remember, the judge, the, the, the sheriff, the mayor, the policeman, the guy who's in charge of their town, saying, avenge me of my adversary. All right. We never know what the issue was, but the widow somehow was wrong, whether it was legally, morally, something has taken place. She was wrong, and she needs justice. But this is a lazy and corrupt judge, and she probably doesn't have money to bribe him to get him to do his job. Verse 4, and he would not for her a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God. Isn't it amazing that he knows he doesn't fear God? Hey, young people, you're in here and you're not right with God. Your life is all about you. You are self-focused, self-serving, self-pleasure-seeking. You know it. You don't need me to tell you. You're not right with God. You're not saved in here. You know it. You have a religion but not a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know it. Back here to verse 4. Though I fear not God, nor regard men. Is it well, I could, I could spend a sermon on verse 4 right there. When young ladies, if he doesn't fear God, he won't regard men. If he doesn't walk with God, he, if he's not faithful to God, he won't be faithful to you. That's right. There you go. some good stuff there, isn't it? This is like premarital counseling. Verse 5. Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she weary me. All right. This widow doesn't give up. She keeps coming and coming and coming. You need to know this. Old ladies don't give up. That's how they become old ladies. So if you're here and you've got an old lady praying for you to get your life right, praying for you to get saved, you need to give up because old ladies don't shut up. This lady does not give up. I don't know how she did it. 
But as I studied this, I'm a child of the 80s. I, was in, I graduated in 88. I love the 80s and all that stuff. Some of you don't know this reference, so I need to show you a video clip. As I thought about her not getting up, going and annoying and annoying and annoying this judge, I thought back to probably my favorite 1980s movie, Better Off Dead. And in that movie, there's a paper boy who won't give up. I just want to show you this because I just think it's funny I'm doing this in church. <laughs> Twenty papers, that's two dollars. Plus two. Gee, Johnny, I had a dime, sorry. Didn't ask for a dime. Two dollars. Well, it's funny, see, my mom had to leave early to take my, my brother to school and my dad worked us. Two dollars. Two dollars. No. My mother's gonna be so mad I showed this. showed up when he was least expecting it, but she would not give up. And right there, right there is where most people leave the story. And they think that this whole parable is about you not giving up. And if you in prayer will annoy God, that God will eventually have to give in just to get rid of you. And I've heard people preach this, especially on TV, annoy God, just like this lady, two dollars, God, two dollars, and keep giving him your prayer request, and eventually God will give in. That's a great lesson about prayer, about you being consistent, about not giving up. But that's really not the lesson that this parable is going to be about. Because that lesson is about what? It's about us. It's about us not giving up. It's about us continually praying. The problem with this whole parable and about us applying this into prayer is this, is that God is not an unjust God. The judge was lazy and corrupt, and there's no way he can represent God, because every time in one of God, Jesus' parables, when it's God, he is a good, faithful man, or like the parable of the prodigal son, he is the father who stays and lovingly receives his son back and goes and looks for him. God is not unjust. And if you walk out of here thinking, well, I better annoy God because somehow God is holding back on me. Somehow God is not giving me what's best for me. You have missed the entire parable. And just like the priest, you have made everything about you. And you need a new owner in your life. There's a good lesson about praying, and I want you to pray. But that's not what this parable is about. Jesus makes a point here. Look at verse 6. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust say, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bare him long? It's a lot like Jesus would say also later. How many of you fathers know how to do good to your sons? Won't God, who is our Heavenly Father, do even better for us? But the main focus of this parable is not you. You read this, and if you're the owner of your life, you will read through this, and you will think, okay, this applies directly to me. But the focus of this parable isn't the widow. The focus of this parable is the judge. The focus of the parable is that the judge isn't God. The focus of the parable is really how much better God is than this judge. The focus of this parable is not that you're the widow and you're destitute. Listen, if you've got Jesus, you've got everything you need. The focus of the parable isn't you or the widow. The focus is how bad this judge is and how much better our God is. Yeah. And until you get a new owner, you will constantly focus on you. And like the priest in the video, we pull attention away from the person who most deserves it. And we direct it at ourselves. And when my life is under a new owner, that, when 
it's under a new owner, that is when it will break good. If you're taking notes, without Jesus, I would control my life and I would get a me result. And see, that's the problem in your life. You're the owner, you make the decisions, you make the choices, and the result is a you result. How's that working out? How's that going on? You know, I've never yet anyone who has a God for owner, that Jesus is the owner of their life. I've never yet found them uh, in, in, in Skid Row. I've never yet found them in rehab. I've never yet found them going through so many of the disasters of life that we just sort of assume, well, this just sort of takes place, this happens. How is that working out for you as you as the owner? I kind of left a blank spot for you. You sort of fill this in this week on your own. But I ask you this question. My life without Jesus. This week, just sort of think where your life would be without Jesus. Where God wants you to be in your life. And who owns your life. Because the point of the parable is right here in the last verse. Look at verse 8. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Another lesson. Here's the question he asks. When the Son of Man cometh, this is Jesus, he's talking about his second coming, shall he find faith on earth? The point of this parable is what God finds. And what he's looking for, what he's looking for is faith. And to have that kind of faith that God would, re would find and deserving and, and want to see, you need a new owner. I'm going to give you three things about faith. Faith with a new owner. Faith in a new owner, number one, requires a heart change. It requires a heart change. Uh, the late Bob Jones Sr. once said, most people will miss heaven by 12 inches. And I want you to understand this, because Jesus himself will give a parable, and the parable will be about a future story, basically. He's telling the true future that there will be people that come before him and say, Lord, didn't we do all these great things? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we teach in your name? We told people about you. Didn't we do all these other things? And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You had a great religion. You had a great work system. You were a moral person, but you did not know me as personal Savior. If you're taking notes, Salvation is not a head decision. Salvation is not a lifestyle reform. See, I can get any one of these young people, I can tell them, repeat this prayer after me. And they'll repeat it after me. But that is not salvation. We talk to God, and yes, I believe it's through prayer, and so, yeah, we do a prayer. But it is not just some head knowledge. And many people will think they're going to heaven because they have a head knowledge of who Jesus is. They know Him like they know history. They know Him like they know facts. But they've never had a heart knowledge. What does Paul say throughout Romans, especially in chapter 10? It is with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And salvation is not a lifestyle reform. You don't need to get cleaned up before you take a bath, right? Hey, I hope you stop doing some of those habits that are really killing your body or maybe bad for your family. And I hope some of the things I teach you are good for you. Maybe you take away and go, okay, maybe I'll stop doing this. Maybe I'll change my family. I hope that's it. But the linchpin of everything I teach, the linchpin of everything I'm talking about is knowing Christ as your personal Savior. Yeah. Now listen, smoking will not send you to hell. It will just make you smell like you've been there. All right? I don't want you to quit smoking. Number one. That's not my number one goal. I don't want you to quit doing drugs. I don't want you to quit drinking. I don't want you to quit watching uh, dirty movies. I don't all these lists of things. That's not my number one goal. My number one goal is that you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And after that, He will take care of your lifestyle. He said, well, Pastor Steve, my lifestyle has never changed after Jesus. And he didn't meet Jesus. You have a great head knowledge. Number two, faith with a new owner. It creates a new legacy. Um, Creates a new legacy. In college football, some of the teams, Oregon especially, and Boise State, some of these just doing ridiculous uniforms. I hate it. I hate the ridiculous. You, you look like a duck. Who, who fears a duck? Ooh, there's a duck coming. People kick ducks. Come on. An eagle. Okay, there's an eagle. A talon. A lion. Or a wolverine. People fear that. Um, 
But one of, you know, one of the reasons, I was listening to sports radio, they, they made a great point about all the teams that are changing their uniforms and new stuff, and they said Alabama will never change their uniform. Penn State will never change their uniform. Michigan will never change their uniform. Because they have a legacy of victory. And all the teams that have no 100 years of playing, of winning championships, all the teams that don't have it, they have no legacy to hold on to, and so they will change their uniforms. Listen, faith in a new owner creates a new legacy in your life. I don't care where you were last night. I don't care where you were before you came to know Jesus. You were a drug addict. You were promiscuous. You, I don't, you, were, you stole money from a bank. You were anything. I, mean, I, don't care what, I don't care if you were a congressman or even the governor of Illinois. That's pretty bad. I don't care where you were then. When I accept Christ as my Savior, it creates a new legacy. You did, listen, up until this point, you've done everything wrong. Today, put Jesus in control and start a new legacy and make some changes. Amen? Amen. That's one of the greatest things about Jesus. It just gives you a whole ability to wipe the past away. You say, how is that possible? Listen, you're still going to have some of the issues, still some of the same struggles you have, but as far as God is concerned, you are new. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Religion can't change you. Religion can't change that standing with God. Only Jesus can do that. Yep. So with that in mind, I left you a blank spot this week. I want you to think about it. With Jesus, my future will be. Take a thought this week and write it down. Pick out things that reflect that God is in control in your life. With Jesus, my future will be winning the lottery. That doesn't reflect God being in control in your life. That reflects you being in control of your life. But with Jesus, my future will be, I'm going to give to missions. I'm going to give to my church. I'm going to be faithful. With Jesus in control, I may actually go on a mission trip. I may do something beyond my normal comfort zone. I may actually feed homeless people. That's gross and icky. I may do something completely outside my comfort zone. With Jesus, my future will be, I will forgive. Someone who's done me wrong. Amen? Amen. Your life today. And I, I, do you know you've seen stores? Especially stores who've done bad, right? And they've done poorly serving their customers and everything. And they're kind of going under. They sort of restart with a new name. And they put out the big banner that says, Under New Management. Today that's your life. You've done poorly. You've made the choices. It's been you. It's been a you life. You've had you results. Everything. Today, all things have become new. But it only takes place if Jesus becomes the new owner. Amen? Amen. And lastly, faith in a new owner, number three, gives us an undeserved reward. What do you get on your investment in work? This man here, Howard Tracy Hall. You may not know him, uh, but his life, what he's done has impacted your life. Uh, back in the 50s, he worked for GE, and uh, he, signed, he was a scientist, and he figured out how to synthesize, make diamonds. And that diamonds is necessarily you wear your ring, but they use them in, in business for all sorts of things, diamond cutting things. It's a very vast thing. And so GE took this technology, and literally GE made billions from his work and what he was able to do. They made billions of dollars from this man. And they're today still making money off of his ability. Do you know what GE gave him? They gave him a $10 savings bond. That is all he got for what he did. Because he didn't own the patent, GE owned it. What do you get for your rewards? You know, people will do you wrong. But with God, your work, your rewards, you will get more than you deserve. You will receive more than you could ever imagine. First Peter says this, under a new owner, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and faded not away, reserved in heaven for you. And with that verse, let me give you three things quickly. Rewards from God are future orientated. So I want it all right now. That's not how God works. That's not how it works. They're eternal lasting. Well, I want rewards. Listen, you may want a reward that to God is nothing more than a donut. I know we serve donuts, but really eating donuts are the most ridiculous thing you could ever eat. It is a waste of chewing muscles. 
because they offer nothing good for you, right? And you say, well, I want a donut, and we do that with God. I want that donut, God. I want that donut reward, and I want it now. And God is like, why would you want a donut when I've got a steak? If you'll just hold out, I've got a steak. Is there anything better than a steak? Man, the food that has parents is the best food. It means it's meat. Yeah, all right. And lastly, God's reward is without a blemish. I mean, as you go back, as we've gone through this today, your life, I mean, there's some blemishes on there. And I wouldn't open the, the, the crowd because we don't have time, but I almost feel so confident having lived long enough that I could stand up here and ask and give testimony and say, who in here has a blemish on your life because of what Jesus has done? Who in here has found yourself, <clears throat> woke up, passed out at a party because of Jesus? Who here has had your, your family ripped apart and shredded because of what Jesus has done and led you to do? But yet, how many of you could stand and give testimony of the issues you're struggling with today, the problems in your family, the cycle of sin that has caused you problems and issues, you're trying to get it out so it doesn't affect your kids. All of that has happened because why? Because you are in control and the decisions you make. God's rewards when He's your owner are future. They're eternal, and they have no blemish. As we close, heard this in the news this week, and I thought it was perfect for what we're talking about. This man, his name is Ross Ulrich, all right? And he is the creator of something called Silkwood, Silk Road. Silk Road, if you don't know this, this is bizarre. It almost parallels the whole story of this. Silk Road is a website that he created. Right? And uh, it was a, I don't know how it all works computer-wise, but you couldn't trace the IP, everything. And so through this website, people all around the world were buying heroin, cocaine, and it would be mailed to them, and they could do it. They could take all the issue of being caught up, and they were even doing like hits, putting out, having hitmen kill other people. Worldwide thing he created, and it, it, it did it for like just two years. It took him to do this. The man is made estimated is in the billions. I mean, they don't know exactly how to calculate it. He was a genius what he did. All this stuff. And they finally caught him this week. Now, why I tell you that, young people, they'll catch you eventually. But why I really tell you this is because I heard the story. And what the story is this, why this guy did it. He's a young guy. But he said he woke up at age 29 and realized he had done nothing with his life and achieved no goals and decided one day at 29 to just sort of break back and just make a decision and I'm going to go through this and I'm going to make as much money. In fact, he, uh, they, they caught him because he put out two different hits on people that he thought were trying to... I mean, it's crazy and all this stuff. Look at this kid. He looks like somebody might take your daughter to prom. It's not mine. It'll punch him. But, you know, and you see this. But all of a sudden, just one day at age 29, the life kind of got to him. He decided, you know what I'm going to do? I don't really like the direction of my life. I don't think I've got enough money. I don't think I've got a return for every, all my work. And in one day's notice, he just decided, I'm going to do something evil. And he ruined a lot of people. There's people dead because of him. One day, one moment, your life can pivot on one decision. And today that decision needs to be to put Jesus in control. Yep. What a difference your story of your life could be when you look back and say, this is the day I got saved. This is the day, okay, I was saved, but I was just playing around. This is the day Jesus became Lord. This is the day they put the banner out in my life and said, under new management. What a difference it would be. Every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around, just you, me, and Jesus for just a moment. We're going to close. Do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Now, 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 do you have a religion? Did you do certain religious rites? Uh, now, did you say some magic prayer? There isn't one. But at some point, did you realize you were a sinner separated from God and you asked Christ to be the payment for your sin? Come into your heart and be the Lord of your life. And believers, you got your ticket out of hell and you did that. But when is He going to become the owner? When? So man, it's been 20 years, and I would suggest maybe that prayer you said was a head knowledge and not a heart knowledge. When do you get a new owner? Dear gracious heavenly Father.